This one is applicable to all Schedule 2s and 3s. So this will be applicable to the Rand Waters and the SNP, the Consulates of the World, the CSRs, everyone really at, uh, in the PFMA. And we, we anticipate when 120 is updated, we go through as well. It's really trying to fix some of the problems that existed with the previous instruction circulars that were issued. And that was issued over a year ago. Uh, it was withdrawn middle of last year, uh, actually late last year, with, um, in, in the most weirdest way. I, I, I cannot describe it in any other way but to say that it was a mess. Um, it was issued, I think, in September last year. It was effective September 2022. Um, in early this year then, I think it was about March, they withdrew it, but they backdated the withdrawal to somewhere in October. So there's this, you know, September, October, a couple of weeks where the instruction was effective, and then it was withdrawn, but it was withdrawn by way of a memo, an email, correspondence. And, uh, and all the legal folk that we've spoken to said that that email has got no legal force. It doesn't do anything. You can't withdraw a legal provision that was issued um, by way of an email. You have to use the same or a, or a higher order mechanism to actually withdraw it. So I, I've been telling everybody that, that that, in fact, is still in place. And uh, and let's see if, if this is going to possibly address the issues that were raised previously. Basically saying that there's been a blurring of the line between session and assignment. And most people, whether in the private sector or public sector, when you talk about seeding a session, then they automatically understand that as actually being assignment. And I'll take you through that now. What, uh, what they do is they just remind us that there is Section 217 Constitution and that people really are appointed through a, a lawful procurement process to do a, a piece of work. A contract. They uh, appointed through 217 to contract for goods and services. Um, and, and what has been happening is that there have been issues after the award. And one of the issues has been that people, once they receive the contract, they then assign that contract to someone else who didn't participate in the 217 process. And, and Treasury is saying that that is not constitutionally correct, and, and they're right. Um, you know, to, for someone who has not gone through the process to then get the results of, of, of someone else's endeavours is certainly not right. Now, what is assignment? Assignment refers to the transfer of rights and obligations in a contract from an assignee, assigner to an assignee. So, it's the rights and obligations. So they, they have to do the work, but they also have the right then to receive the payment for the work that they do. So that's that's what Treasury is saying is an assignment. They, they award the deal to a contractor and that contractor says, says, hey, we're not gonna do this work. We assign the full rights and obligations of this contract to someone else. They will do it, please pay them. And just reminding us again that this is not in line with uh, Section 27 of the Constitution, but they go on to refer to Clause 19 of the GCC that makes provision for assignment. And it says the supplier shall not assign in whole or in part its obligation to perform, perform under the contract, except with the purchaser's prior written consent. So that currently is in Clause 19 of the GCC, applicable to both uh, local government and PFU. Then they go on to say that, that um, this transfer is not in line with 217 and therefore is not allowed. So they're just saying fully that if ever there is an assignment of this nature, it's not allowed. The implication of 3.4 above 
is that clause 19 of the GCC should not be applied in its current form for future consideration. Paragraph 3.4 takes place of this. The 3.4 saying it's not allowed. Slightly different wording to what they used in the previous version of instruction 8 and circular 120, but meaning the same thing that, um, that under no obligations will assignment be allowed. Let's jump then through to session. And I, I don't foresee any significant issues with session. We'll come back to assignment and discuss that shortly. What session is, is the transfer only of the rights of the service provider that they have in terms of, of the contract, where the commercial contract, the main right involved is the right to be paid for services rendered. So what they're saying is, is a session to them or seeding is, is hey, we, we will continue to render the services, we'll continue to provide you with the goods that you have contracted us to do, but please, will you pay this other organization? And this happens often, it happens often um, because there are state-owned organizations, organs of, organs of state that provide seed funding or bridge funding. There are banks that provide bridge funding. There are other institutions that that provide bridge funding. While permissible, it's important that the application thereof in the public is carefully regulated to limit possible instances of abuse through fronting arrangements and similar processes. One of the organizations that I've been involved in, they had um, a dealings with a particular lawyer. That uh, that lawyer, because of a range of issues, had to close his legal practice but he had not yet been paid for the work that that legal practice had done at the organ of state and requested that the organ of state should, instead of paying them, which, is, which was not possible any longer, they must pay a new entity which he created. Um, he had created that entity some time ago, but, but that's the way that he wants to do it. What, what the... The draft instruction is saying is that should a third party wish to provide this, then that entity must be registered with the Financial Service Conduct Authority. And this is the major change that happened from the old instruction in Circular 120. Previously, this spoke about um, somebody registered with the Financial Services Board. I think that was it, or, or it basically, it, no, no, it wasn't the Financial Service Board. It was basically talking about banks, um, and it left out all the other different entities out there that are regulated properly, um, governed by the FSCA, and, um, and hence they've at last fixed that. I would, would welcome anyone who's um, in this space to just confirm whether this is this will address the issues that have been raised previously. Must only be applicable to the transfer advice of payment for services rendered or goods delivered by a service provider condition that paragraph 4.4 is complied with. Written request for session of contracts is only submitted by the appointed service provider for consideration of the of state. Written request for the appointed service provider must be accompanied by the session agreement signed between the appointed service provider and the third party for consideration of the revenue of the state. Some say this is not right that uh, somebody else would get paid for work that you've done. Uh, this is a very, very common practice and instrument that is used uh, throughout um, the state and many, many countries around the world. This is applicable um, to Schedules 2 and 3 uh, to the PFMA. As I say, this will also be applicable to 120 as well. I'm sure it will. Um, and uh, then, then they go on to say that the instruction is issued in terms of 764C and will take effect from date to be determined. And I think this certainly is one thing that we want to give some feedback to Treasury on. Um, so uh, just uh, checking if that FSCA point will, will work and um, it doesn't look like it. Uh, necessary way to do that again. So there we are. There's, um, I see a couple of you putting some con comments on, on the chat. You're welcome to send it to everybody. Um, I will I will mention the substance of your, your comment without mentioning your name to the group. So let's just quickly go back 
And uh, let's kick off then uh, with any comments that you've got regarding the assignment issue. And then we'll talk about the, the session points. So a couple of points that are coming through. Um, again, this is um, a baby and bath water issue, not dealing with the problem that has other tools and infrastructure play space that does not deal with range with these supplies and contractors. Um, yeah, I think I think that's my key issue as well. So you're welcome to to unmute any, anyone. You are able to unmute and comment. If you want to raise your hand, you're welcome to do that. Um, okay, so let uh, let me just share with you my concern with this one. We understand that that if somebody goes through a process, a two one seven process, they get awarded the contract. And then they give that contract to someone else. That person is going to get the benefit of that contract without following a 217 process. And, and all the issues that we know, are aware of, uh, tax clearance registered on CSD, um, all the issues regarding uh, restricted bidders, um, directors and shareholders, uh, the issues regarding declarations of interest, all those issues they would have bypassed and manage to get the contract. However, this is this is my point, and I welcome anyone's comments. You're welcome to put this in the chat. What about a contractor that is, say, one year into a two-year contract, they're doing a road or they're doing some pavement work, and they get acquired. There's a merger or they are acquired. Technically, what that means is that they, they will lose their identity that they had previously, that they was used to get that work. And they will then take on a new name, very likely also a new a PTY limited company number, registration number, and very likely new bank accounts. And so that contract then will, in my view, in my understanding, then be assigned from that original company to this new entity, be it the merged entity or the one that has acquired the construction. My understanding of this is that contract will have to be canceled and there is not an option to do that assignment. So halfway through the contract, this is telling you you've got to cancel that contract. Now that's my understanding of this. Any any thoughts? Let's uh, let's just see. Um, business amalgamation issues. Absolutely. Um, they they're not considering that. It is a lawful thing that will, will take place, and um, all contracts would need clauses drafted that entities contracts to cancel from. That's that's my that's my concern. My concern is that technically everyone is sending out the GCC with clause 19 in it. Treasury said already a year and a half ago that they're going to issue an update to GCC. We've not seen that. So GCC, uh, you know, clause 19 is going out there. What you're going to have to do for every quotation and tender is put into your documents a special condition of contract changing clause 19 to be something along the lines of what they're saying here. Yeah. That's, I think, going to be significant. And I, 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 I really don't understand the logic with this one. So I don't know. Am I reading too much into this? Any thoughts? I sure. Yes, hello, Santi. Go ahead first, Sorry. Santi, and then, then we'll go to Arna. Yeah, Hi, th thanks. Thanks, Sean. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry I missed the first few minutes of the meeting, so I'm not quite clear on what has been discussed already. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with your points about this is a, a lawful process. Um, firstly, a lawful process. Secondly, a very established process in business. Um, and it it, 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 uh, it's... Uh, and again, I apologize if I'm reiterating something that's already been said, but I, I really would like to, just while we're talking about this this clause of the GCC, 
bring a, bring to everybody's attention a very important aspect within the health sector. Um, I mean, remembering that this meeting, when you started this platform, it was about PPE and, and how we were responding to COVID. So the health sector was kind of at the forefront of the, the origin of this discussion, these discussions. Um, we, like many other state departments, procure products from international manufacturers. And those manufacturers do not sell in all cases directly into the South African market. They sell via distributors. Yeah. And those distribution rights change on a semi-regular basis as determined by the international manufacturer. What the National Treasury is doing by preventing us from being able to allow for the assignment of contracts effectively means we would have to cancel an existing contract and the national treasury is going to be affected by this just as much as as we as provincial health departments are going to be if you think about any of the big transversal contracts for things like bandages and dressings syringes and needles and any clinical consumable contract including pharmaceuticals we cannot forget about pharmaceutical products those distribution rights change on a regular basis those contracts would have to be cancelled because of the inability to assign or novate the contract from one um, service provider to another. And we would then have to enter into an incredibly time consuming and ultimately pointless exercise of appointing the new service provider by means of a limited bid to ensure continuity of supply. Um, and ultimately there's not going to be any change in the outcome. We're still going to be contracting with the new distributor of those products. So by, by saying that the GC that the clause 19 of the GCC no longer applies, um, you're, you're going to have to retrospectively amend every single contract that has ever been issued in across every state department. It's not just a case of new procurement exercises. If assignment is no longer required, you have to amend every single contract. Um, and I mean, so just in the Western Cape alone, that's in the thousands of contracts, because we're not just talking about formal bidding, we're also talking about quotations resulting in contracts under the value of a million rand. It's yeah. a huge exercise. So you're, you're amending existing contracts, you're precluding service providers from doing business to with you according to established um, commercial mechanisms that apply in all markets globally and for good reason, yeah. which ultimately is going to preclude us from being able to trade with providers who are selling products of the appropriate quality into the market, which again, from a, from a healthcare perspective is imperative because if we're buying lower quality products from suppliers who are not procuring and distributing internationally, not to say that all products that are produced locally are of lower quality. That's not my point at all. But it, it is, unfortunately, in the medical market, still the case that the best quality products are produced overseas. So if we're precluded from trading with those providers, then we are inherently subscribing to the view that poor quality service is acceptable and is actually proscribed, prescribed, by the National Treasury in preventing us from being able to, to assign contracts. Um, and and my, my final point is, is no, just on, make a point. No. Sorry, so thank you, Sean. Just on, on um, the the paragraph 3.4, that effectively this this draft document is saying that the common law is inherently unconstitutional. <laughs> Which is also completely so, Thank you. If I can ask you, and, I, I, and Anna, I'll come to you and then do I see your hand. Let, let's, let's, let's say that you know, Treasury is right to say that the practice of, of, um, of some organizations going and doing the tender process and then selling that contract to their friends to deliver on and getting a little referral fee or some, some, something along those lines, is wrong. What, what could Treasury do then to mitigate that risk? One of the ideas I have is, would it make sense if, for example, there was some clause in here to say that uh, this can only 
this only applies after you know, a percentage of the contract duration has run. This only applies, um, or, or this does not apply if a percentage of the contract is already run. This does not apply if the contract is is um, you know one month into the delivery of the contract. This does not apply if they've already received their first payment. Would those suggestions maybe mitigate the, their concern? Because they're they're obviously stuck on this issue that they're very worried about all these guys getting this work. But just a, a quick question to you. So absolutely, Sean, um, one of the pieces of feedback that we're submitting via our provincial treasury to the national treasury is exactly that, that the, we recognize that we're seeking to prevent corruption or fraud or one, one way or the other. Um, but a one size fits all approach is not the solution. So there need to be certain categories of assignment that must be allowed one of which needs to include something along the lines of sole supplier status, where sole supplier status is shifting from one vendor to another, or where distribution rights are changing and where you can clearly demonstrate that those certain criteria are being met. Um, my concern around limiting the timing of the assignment of the project, of the, of the contract, is that those international role players could not give a flying flip-flop about our regulations. They're going to change their distribution rights whenever they want to. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. It's, Thank you. Um, oh, oh, no, I know you did um, want to say something. And then we'll go to Lundinia and then we'll go to Zakiswa. Yeah, thanks, Sean. I think Santi spoke to to most of the the issues. I, I, I mean, this is now the second iteration of this thing. When, when it came out last year, my municipality... Uh, chose not to adopt it because obviously in terms of 168 we have the we have the cho choice to do that you're, you're, I wonder you're what able to do that at the moment I, yeah at the moment <laughs> I wonder what the purpose of this is if this if the purpose of this is to to uh, deal with fronting and in corrupt practices I can with, with, I can categorically state this will be 100 percent unsuccessful yeah. because the tool the tools for fronting is already there deal with deal with it in that space if the purpose of this is to completely destroy service delivery, I can again categorically say it will be 100% successful because you, we, are, we are going to destroy small businesses. We're going to destroy, we, we're dealing with, with small contractors. They, they operate, <laughs> their business yeah. model, so to speak, yeah, is yeah. the operation through sessions. With, and if, 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 if we can't see those payments to the suppliers, those guys are not going to operate. So there's, there's, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that this has been thought through. I think the legal minds can talk to it much greater, but this is going to end most of us in court and um, yeah. we're going con completely contrary to any yeah. contractual yeah. conditions. It's just, it's just weird. Eh? We're, we're in this position again, just they've not addressed the issue. Um, and sorry, yeah, go ahead, Arlen. Sorry, Sean, you asked the question about whether the change um, in the language in the assignment would would change. I don't believe it does. It's still limiting you to a to a financial services type of company. Now, a lot of the smaller um, arrangements that my small contractors have with a, a aluminium supplier or that guy's not a financial services company. Yeah. So within the within the infrastructure environment, this is again. Um, it's not going to solve the problem that we have with that we had with it previously. I'm, I'm just just seeing a comment here, just while you're on it, is that uh, there, there are credit providers that are governed by the National Credit Regulator that fall outside of the FSCA. Uh, so I think they've, they've missed it again. So I was hoping that they would, but uh, yeah, I'm sure. All right. Let's uh, let's jump to Lindiwe. Hi, Lindiwe. Hi, hi, Sean. Can you go to 3.4? Yes, thank you. Yeah, there, there we talks about yes. So my my comment is around clause 3.3, and yeah, from 3.3 up until 3.5. Currently, when we advertise the bids uh, or the RFQs, we need to attach the GCC. So is National Treasury saying that if they're saying clause 19 is no longer applicable, and they have not yet provided us with the revised GCC? Are they saying that because one of the things that they said about the GCC was that they're generic, we are not allowed to amend them. So in this case, 
what needs to happen when we attach the GCC around clause 19? Are we supposed to come up with our own disclaimer as entities to say that the, the, the GCC are generic, however, with the exception of clause 19? Because the way, yeah, it, it's for, for me, I think it's a, it's a challenge because it, it will mean that we have to make it clear to the prospective bidders that clause 19, clause 19 is not applicable in light of this instruction note, unless by the time that they issue a revised instruction note, then they would have revised a clause 19 of the GCC. Yeah, yeah. But my understanding is that the mechanism you will use will be a special condition of contract. You will we'll have to describe that special condition of contract as, as replacing clause 19 with a a new clause, which this is saying, it's prohibited. You will not be able to do it. That's, um, so that's the mechanism. So you're, you're technically not changing GCC, but you are uh, you're supplementing it with, with uh, an SEC. And, and I think that's the practice now. And uh, you know, welcome, welcome any of any any others online who might um, just support that. So I think that's. Um, Typically, what would happen, but it'll do it. I mean, this is this is my concern as well. I mean, this means every quotation and every bid that you're now issuing, you're going to have to look at this little issue. Yes, your templates are going to have to change. And and I, you know, Santi's spot on. <laughs> this is yes. a condition of contract, which means existing contracts have to change as well. Mm. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a very very yeah. okay. So, guess what? Thanks, Lindima. Anything else, Lindima? No, that's all, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. So, case why? Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, first, I want to say, Santi, those were great points that when I was reading through this, I hadn't considered the implications of the assignments, especially when with these international distribution arrangements and uh, store sources, etc. Um, so I would say before last year's instruction note came out, our organization had a contract management framework in terms of which you define a session and assignment, innovation, etc. And for assignments specifically, we set out the rules and regulations for consideration, including that the new assignee would then have to be subjected to the same evaluation by the BEC that the assigner had been subjected to so that you can verify they are proper, even the stuff that's done by, the checks that are done by our forensic unit to verify the organization, still you get to um, subject them to similar um, uh, um, processes. And that way you are assuring that you followed and uh, to some extent complied with section 217 that you're getting a uh, return on investment, you're getting a service provider who's capable of delivering, et cetera. So now that assignments are being taken away, the implications as Santi has pointed out um, are quite serious, especially when you consider the highly specialized um, industries, for example, for chemicals, you know, you only have so many uh, um, players in the market for chemical in the chemical space. So once now, if for example, when um, the sole supplier status has changed of certain chemical manufacturers or distributors, then what do you do? You're left in the lurch without uh, service providers in place and how do you continue with service provision? Uh, yeah, so this, uh, I agree with Anna that it's just putting service delivery uh, 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 continuity in, in quite a challenge if we are to comply with it as it is. For clause 4.5.1 for me provides a bit of confusion because it seems like they're almost trying to go back to the previous situation as it was or as how we were applying it in that um, you can cede uh, payments for goods and services rendered but uh, but then they then go back to say clause 4.4 which talks about financial services institutions still apply then I'm not understanding because in some instances my experience is that sometimes sessions are made to subcontractors where there might be difficulties in the relationship between the main contractor and the subcontractors so they will see the payment in for to pay for the services that they have provided to the main correct contractor in relation to this contract and then they get paid directly by the employer so those kinds of sessions so now if the subcontractor is not a financial services institution then you kind of negating what you say in the first instance of the clause by reintroducing clause 4.4 which now kind of doesn't 
make any kind of sense. And in other instances, our uh, contractors or, or, or service providers are seeding funds for services or, or, or services or goods or any monies that are received that are not even related to the contract at hand. So they have other debt relating to other things, but they want to use a portion of the work. So as part of our contract management framework, we also had limitations because we wanted to verify I, I, you must have enough money left in this contract that you are physically able to continue with providing us. So you can't go broke in the middle of providing us a contract because you see the too much for your other debts and things. So we had parameters in place where we were safeguarding uh, uh, against the main contractor ceding too much and not being able to continue with the works, etc. So being allowed a certain... Um, extent of sales governing or self determining for ourselves what le level of risk we are willing our level of risk appetite in this regard has always worked so now i, I don't know how to interpret 4.5.1 and how do we even apply it wow. thank you very much thank you good i mean we're, we're in such a dynamic country we have got organizations that are changing all the time and we we're, we're, you know, we're we're forcing the subcontracting um, mechanism onto many contracts and that's what happens is, is the prime contractor finishes the, the subcontractor still got to do the work the prime contractor runs into trouble or something like that and says hey just please you know, these guys will carry on doing the work just please, please pay them Santi I, I noted your, your comment um, please you're welcome to, to add to what's been said so far Thanks, Sean. I just wanted to um, jump on what, what Arno was mentioning around the, the infrastructure um, guys, the small guys, and, and my, my, my point is slightly different to that, um, but it demonstrates how a one-size-fits-all instruction can be can have incredibly detrimental unforeseen consequences. So I'm going to take everybody, everybody back to about 2015 when there was a national crisis in the processing of hazardous waste, specifically healthcare risk waste, yes. but it was hazardous across the board. It was on um, carte blanche, a yeah. whole big deal. Um, and ultimately what happened was the contractor had run into some substantial cash flow problems. And as a result, healthcare risk waste was literally piling up ceiling high in their processing plants. Um, and we're talking, among other things, anatomical waste, which was really quite disturbing for people who had to see those images on TV who are not used to dealing with anatomical waste. So in order to address the challenges locally, we ended up having a negotiation with the, sorry, I just want to add, the risk of that particular challenge is that if we are in contravention of the relevant um, regulations under NEMA, under the National Environmental um, Management Act and the waste regulations pertaining to it, the, the head of department responsible for producing the waste is issued a contravention notice and the head of department themselves personally, that actual human being, is liable to a 10 million rand fine or 10 years in prison if they're not able to resolve the contraventions within a prescribed amount of time. So in order to prevent our HOD from going to prison, we then mm -hmm. had negotiations with the healthcare waste management contractor that we had appointed. And we uh, agreed that cash flow was the root cause of the problem. And instead of us paying the contractor, we paid their subcontractors on their behalf because we knew that if we paid the main contractor, that money was just going to disappear into a black hole. And by paying the, the subcontractors directly, we were able to then clear the backlog of physical waste piled up at the, uh, the subcontractor's premises, and we could get the machinery running, and, and that kind of contributed to the, the problem resolving itself. So it, it also precludes us from under... Um, legally prescribed circumstances from actually putting mechanisms in place where we need to arrange alternative payment mechanisms with our contractors. I know that's a highly um, specific circumstance, but I'm sure that if I have an example like that, other colleagues must have examples like that within their own unique circumstances. And I, I think that's not being considered effectively in this particular requirement either. Thanks. Great, great example. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Ona is just raising another issue. That's uh, in the construction space where we've got FIDIC and JVCC and DCC and NEC and and all of those have got assignment clauses in it. Um, those will have to change. So again, you'll need to use that um, you know, that mechanism to change an existing contract form 
to something which is, um, oh boy, it's, um, yeah. I wonder where this is coming from. Um, yeah, hi, Santi. Another point, eh? Yes, Sean, sorry, I forgot to mention in my earlier point. Um, just on that point, um, my other concern is around the lawfulness of the NTI prescribing to all contractors that they are going to be bound by a term to which they did not agree at the inception of the contract. So if we're saying that all contracts have to be amended, they're subject to mutual agreement. Can an NTI impose that? And is that is that, uh, I know that there's a whole debate around the lawfulness of instructions versus regulations versus acts, but does an NTI have the power to impose that above the normal principles of common law, assuming the common law is not unconstitutional? Thank you. And it's going to raise issues on, on audits. So that's, so that's a big question, and it's just going to give lots of uncertainty when it comes along with fast to get into this. I think we've covered this. Thank you all for your, your contributions. Let me just quickly check. Um, if Komoto, Komoto, are you still on? Um, hi, John. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. Just uh, explain to us a little bit more about, about your predicament. And um, I, I was hoping that this was going to solve your, your, your issues, but no. it seems not. No, I think it's it's still phrasing it the same way. Um, I think previously it was just saying you need to be registered as an FSP, financial services provider, which yeah. basically means you need to be registered with that institution. That is so now they just change the designation to the institution that you need to register with. That, that that's the FSCA. Um, and I think I also noticed that they, they've removed the, you remember previously, they also included state institutions that are formed to provide funding. So now 4.4 excludes your institutions such as CIFA. I think uh, that's still... Oh, they, it's still there. It's, it's still state. there, yes. I think, they, the, I think that all the state aspect is still here. Um, let me see. I'm reading it for the first time here, so yeah, excuse me. On state plans, uh, session, the, 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 mm -hmm. to this end on 4.4. Uh, no, no, I think you're no, right. No, no. Uh, yeah, so they've excluded that. But I think critical, and, and this is the thing that we raised last year in August when, when the first uh, instruction was issued to say um, FSCA. Uh, regulates financial services such as your insurance. It does not regulate credit. And session in this context, it's, it's about those that are providing uh, funding. I think Arnold made mention of material suppliers, for instance, if you get your the likes of your cash build as an example that will provide material to um, be, uh, contractors in the uh, infrastructure space, they will be registered with the national credit regulator as a national credit pro as a credit provider, and as such, you know, the, if if you have something uh, a provision that says NCR instead of FSCA, then those would be able to uh, take part. But currently, I mean. FSCA basically they are saying that you need to cede to uh, the rights to as uh, to um, a, um, a company that provides insurance, you yeah. know. So yeah. it doesn't it doesn't yeah. deal with with the it doesn't address the issue at all. And I think it's it maybe it's just said that it's the national trade that is supposed to be custodians of all these financial um, uh, laws that is basically confusing the you know the role of FSCA and NCR. And, and I noticed the, on the last end of 4.4, but when it says to legally conducting any financial services business. So FSC doesn't regulate all financial services yes. businesses. And, and that, that is the core of the issue. Thanks. And, and I think I've, I, you're right. I, they, they, they got it wrong. Um, in fact, banks fall outside of FSCA now. 
Um, I recall doing some work there and they told me they no longer look after the banking industry. That's now banking sector uh, regulator. Yes. And, uh, and their focus is on, on financial advisors and stock files. Interesting. I think it's also one of the things that they look after. So, um, Most definitely. Maybe, maybe you need to register as a stock file. <laughs> yeah, hey. Yeah, that, that might yeah but then yeah, also I, you yeah. have those material providers, those uh, um, companies that provide you aluminium that Arnold was talking about, uh, steel, and they would ordinarily, it's, it's in their normal course of business to be credit providers, but not to provide insurance. So they yeah. would not ideally be registered to provide insurance. But I think they are also excluding their own. Uh, institutions that were established to provide their funding, those state institutions that they had covered. In What's very really interesting is um, they've put this out, cannot, uh, you know, the, the notice I think said 10th of August. Um, I think it only landed in email addresses early this week, email boxes early this week. Much of it came out uh, last week. Um, and it's due on, feedback is due on the 18th. So you know, it's a week to get some feedback on this, and um, it seems like they want to rush this through, but yet they've not addressed the issues. Um, so really, really weird what's going on there. All right. If there is nothing else, I think uh, let's, let's close off. I have put into the chat the Word document um, there are a number of people that have joined us since since I did share the documents in, in the chat. So let me just do that again, uh, just in case um, you, you don't have it. Let me quickly get this through. And, um, and please, uh, you, know, you, you this is not going to be very difficult for anyone who's online now to just give some feedback on this. Uh, the more feedback they get, the more they have to take note of, of the uh, points. Uh, so please, um, you know, so I'm sending now uh, the the actual Word document. Uh, it's not difficult. You know the, the sections that you have to comment on. Uh, very easy to comment on this one. It's not difficult at all. And um, there's the, the, the stakeholder comment form. And let me just quickly then share as well instruction for those that are not yet. It. But it's so important to give uh, Treasury feedback on this one and um, and hopefully they, they have to they have to take note. If they have a legal obligation to, to, to consider if, um, the feedback that you give. Next week uh, it's just a uh, subject to one or two changes. Next week, we hope to have a discussion on the public procurement bill and its implications for local government. Um, there's not been a lot of discussion on the imp impact of um, the public procurement bill on local government. My understanding is that uh, if the politicians of local government understood what the public procurement bill is going to mean for them, uh, this the public opinion bill would quickly be put on hold and they will not rush it through. There are fundamental significant changes that the public opinion bill is going to have uh, on municipalities on local government. Um, Honor gave an example up front to say, hey, uh, you, know, you have the, the option to, to decide whether you can consider a circular um, once it's been issued by Treasury, that will no longer apply. You will have to comply with the instructions that are issued by National Treasury in exactly the same way as people or organizations do at the moment. So very, very significant. It's going to take a lot of um, a lot of the the discretion that councils have at the moment, local authorities have at the moment in that respect. So that will be for next week. And um, very nice to see Kevin Nayak online. Kevin, I was hoping we would have a local government discussion today, but we pushed that out to next week, just given the urgency on this one. And um, yeah, thank you very much. If there's nothing else, 
and let's uh, start to draw this meeting to a close.